buildings in it, buildings that were astonishing at some level, uh, whether they were Rockefeller Center or uh, the Empire State Building uh, or the Chrysler Building, buildings that had, had really reached uh, an incredible iconic status in the, in not only in that city but in the world. Um, if you walk by them on the street, they were also enormously urban, urbanistically capable buildings. Um, and these were buildings thought of as uh, at the level of ideas that dirigibles should be moored at the top mass, which is why they originally came to points. <clears throat> Wasn't a great idea, really didn't work, but it became the silhouette and the profile of how people thought about skyscrapers and how th people thought about building tall buildings in New York. But it wasn't at the sacrifice of the city either. These were buildings that could be reconciled into the city grid. They were buildings that were street friendly. They were buildings that had not given up uh, their ideas about craft and construction, techniques of building. And it became, started to become, uh, I started to think about um, how I was approaching work and objects that I was interested in starting to put into a city landscape. Um, the uh, building that was done here uh, had all kinds of associations to the existing building. Um, the way it was handled materially um, already started to uh, have much more of the steel uh, projected out of the frame, so the steel was much more of a presence, uh, much more of a material presence, although it was still a steel skin. Um, it did have much more of a density, and I was already thinking uh, of moving in, in that direction. At the same time, <clears throat> I also was embarking on projects that were somewhat theoretical, um, and often the theoretical uh, dovetails with the practical, and I was approached by uh, a rock musician uh, who I knew from the music business, and Ace Fraley, who was in this very wacky group called KISS, and Ace had a little problem. He had, he had a problem that people would, he'd wake up in the morning and his, he had this condo in Elmsford in White Plains, uh, up in New York in the suburbs, and he'd have these people pressed up against his window. Uh, they'd figure out who he was without his face paint on. And um, I was, had embarked on this idea of, of uh, uh, buildings and landscapes and these landscapes that combined water and architecture. And he saw these, I was talking to about them, and he says, this sounds like the kind of house I could actually really live in and be comfortable in. And so we embarked on a house, it was called the Fraley House, um, built in the middle of a canal of water. It was uh, supposed to be out in uh, Stratford, Connecticut. Uh, we actually found a spot in the Housatonic River that we could have um, where we could have put a, uh, a canal to have uh, canal water run through it. Um, and of course it was at the moment that KISS lost all their money. They had these managers who did a very good job uh, fleecing their uh, assets. And um, so we, it wound up being a drawn project, unfortunately. Um, but it really did begin to explore this idea of the iconic object in the landscape. Uh, it, for me, started to, uh, it allowed me to look at objects made of material density. Uh, this in cast concrete um, and, uh, and tile and colored stone. Uh, I had also done a research project on uh, construction of coloration um, uh, uh, just when I had started in practice. And so I was very interested in the idea of imbuing buildings with color and also that they were more environmentally responsive. They basically lived in a cold weather climate. Why were we building glass buildings? Um, in a cold weather climate when in fact mostly everything else had been made of stone and hard masonry. The drawings began to explore uh, ideas about the stasis of the building, the kind of suggestion that the building could move uh, in the water. The section through the building really started to look at um, the idea of uh, rooms all being different one to the other, made in different colors, different furniture. Uh, and so it, it became a building which had a great yield for me um, in, uh, in a layer of exploration. I also started to think and, and started to read uh, about the discontent that people had um, and, and to a great extent clients, uh, which became more, uh, more noticeable as we started to do public work and work where the environments were much more historic, um, about why people dislike modern architecture so much. And I was actually reading in the paper the other day, there's a movement to tear down Boston City Hall. Um, people actually are vitriolic, they hate it, hate the building. 
And architects have really refused to visit this kind of campground. This is not something that we all feel comfortable uh, trying to understand why there's such a breach in, in this. And I think there is a gap. I think the, I started to be very interested in the criticism that was leveled about art, modern architecture being cold and uh, um, unfriendly, uh, unpleasant, harsh. And uh, so the projects that, that I've been looking through, uh, these are much older, uh, really started to look at that. And the first commission that, that came along was a project to do a series of apartments inside a historic landmark building. Uh, this is a building that was built in 1862 uh, in Newport, Rhode Island. And now <clears throat> I had an owner who was, had a great affection for this and actually had hired another architect who was a real minimalist, told him, and he had this collection of 17th and 18th century real antiques and this architect told him to go home and sell everything because he couldn't take that in his renovation. And fortunately, the guy kind of thought about this and said, this is kind of absurd. I, I, you know, I like this furniture. I should be able to take it with me. Um, and that's how we were called. And, but it, it allowed me to start to think about how do you bridge the distance? How do you begin to put the pieces together? Is there a way to make architecture which is of both worlds? Um, and so uh, within this, we designed a, a complex of apartments. And also very interested in the social structure. I began to become very interested in the program and how you manipulate people's lives and, and the relationships they have. How do we structure them in a way, um, in the way the environment is laid out? Is it about anonymity and separation or is it about amelioration and having people or fostering relationships? The uh, project as it was designed was designed as a city which was inserted into the building. And each of the uh, each of the environments that was built uh, fronted on a public space, had private rooms behind. Uh, we were able to incorporate the uh, furniture of the owner in each of the rooms, design spaces that were in fact unique to each, each and every particular piece of furniture in various rooms. This is the owner's uh, apartment. Of course, the other <coughs> units didn't have owners. They were going to be sold, but we structured them in similar ways. The way the public space between the apartments was done, we adjusted uh, the uh, 1920 renovation of the old building so that there was actually social space uh, that people came out of their apartments and they were confronted with each other. They weren't left in a kind of ad hoc or anonymous uh, relationship. These are triplex units. Uh, that one goes down one level into the basement. This one is up into the attic. We recuperated a lot of the original structure that was in the attic that we found. Um, and it was reused. This is a theme that was done through a number of projects. This for another, uh, a, another historic building in New York in Ladies Mile in Chelsea in Manhattan. Um, this is a project um, which I started as my own apartment. Uh, was a way to begin to think about materials. And uh, you understand this was done in 1982 or 83. So there wasn't furniture done in raw steel then. I was. Uh, couldn't afford to do the renovation, basically. So I found a, uh, an auto shop in the Bronx that was making uh, chassis. And they were able to make all the furniture, the steel base. A lot of the metalwork was done by them. And I, I was also looking for the techniques uh, for also using much more precious metals, things that had inherent beauty to them, uh, not things that were rough. And, uh, we were already coming out of. I was teaching in Paul Rudolph's building at Yale, which is made of raw concrete. I cut, a, I don't know how many shirts open, leaning against the cement. Um, so I was also looking about this interrelationship between precious uh, stone and, and beautiful woodwork and still uh, keeping it uh, a little on the raw side. Um, at the same time, I also was very interested in public projects. And I was very interested in moving into a way of understanding how architecture affected the public. And I started to enter an array of competitions. This one for the peak in Hong Kong. Um, you can see the uh, site uh, is up here, the top of Victoria's Peak. Uh, this is in the Bay of Hong Kong. The project we did was uh, a, had a very elaborate brief to it. It was a uh, competition for uh, timeshared housing. But also buried in here was a very wealthy club, social club, and athletic facility. Um, and I was very interested in the expression of 
uh, how, how this could be manipulated. Also, the owners 